Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Hi, my name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. God Almighty. I was supposed to speak on the 27th of December, but God in his infinite mercy put me into hospital. Uh, I had a trapped nerve, so I couldn't speak here. But I couldn't get away with it, so here I am. And I'm glad to be here. I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic, and I say that because I really mean it. On the 27th of December, when I was supposed to speak, here was the 20th anniversary of my last drink. Uh, so I've got to over 20 years now, a few days over 20 years. I got sober here in Los Angeles at the Pacific Palisades Group on a Monday night, the 29th of December. So I take that as my AA birthday. Although I stayed sober 24 hours on my own, 27, thinking about AA, (laughs) thinking maybe I have a problem, maybe I don't. So God knows how I survived those 24 hours and had the common sense left to do something for my life because I'd never done anything for myself ever or was too proud to ask for help. Um... I couldn't turn around to see the newcomers. I didn't know how many newcomers here because I still got a bit of a problem with my back, uh, which I think is all to do with my alcoholism. But the newcomers are here. Uh, I can tell you that this has been for me the greatest 20 years of my life. Um, it's been but the most dramatic adventure. I couldn't have dreamed of a better adventure, a greater adventure. It's been scary. Wonderful, frightening, all those things. When I first came into AA, I heard many speakers, and I heard some very charismatic speakers who seemed to have a great grasp of their subject, seemed to have an understanding of the dynamics of alcoholism, many speakers, and I used to follow them around and listen to them, and I thought, I wish I could speak like that. Maybe I would be able to speak like that one day. Well, I never did get to that point of my sobriety. I've always been a little nervous of speaking and I don't know why. Um, no idea why. But I've given up trying to put on a good show. Um, I can only describe my feelings of being an alcoholic. I don't have a great intellectual grasp of anything. But I do know how I feel. Especially these last few years. I was born in South Wales. I'll give you the format, as in the big book, what it was like, what happened, and what it is like now. I know how I feel as an alcoholic, and I know how I felt as an alcoholic at the age of four. Um, I think my father was an alcoholic, a periodic alcoholic. Um, My father spread an atmosphere of great gloom and depression around him, because that's what he was. So I remember my early recollections are one, ones of gloom and depression and fear. And that's not unique. I think millions of people experience that, but they're not all necessarily alcoholics. But I always felt like the outsider all my life. And as a child, I was definitely didn't belong to anyone. And I had no friends. I was a lonely little kid. I didn't bother with any other children. Uh, I wouldn't play with any other kids. And when I, my father used to come home from work, my father was a baker. He used to come home from work at the end of the day and he'd ask my mother, where, where is he? Where's Tony? 
And uh, she said, he's at the end of the street. And I'd always be at the end of the street looking at my thumbnails. All the other kids were down the other end. So I guess I was destined for this program. And I see lonely kids today and I wonder if that's what they're all, you know, what they're going to drop. All I can describe is my feelings of loneliness and fear. Uh, my first day at school, I knew I was on the wrong planet. I had no grasp of anything intellectually, uh, of any of the subjects that were being taught. I, for years, put myself down as an idiot, but I realized that I was just different. I had a, a slower metabolism, maybe. I had a, just a slower grasp of things. And those feelings of inadequacy and oddness stayed with me right through the rest of my life. So that I was able to identify them on my first night in AA, which was a remarkable moment for me. I came to America in 1974, a full-blown alcoholic. I'd become an actor, and I used to be ashamed of saying that at one time. I used to be ashamed of my profession, but now it's taken a long time to become used, get used to that. That that is my job, that's what I do, and so I have no apologies for that anymore. But I used to feel very deeply ashamed of my profession. Again, I don't know why. Um, I thought it because it was a kind of sissy's work, I guess. <laughs> it wasn't manly to express feelings. And I come from a society, as everyone knows about Britain, we uh, repress our feelings very, very cleverly. Anyway, I became an actor in the 1960s and um, with a blazing ambition to be get to the top of my profession. I worked like a fiend. And I thought I'd would, success would fill the hole in my gut. And I became very successful in the late 60s and early 70s in Britain. Uh, very successful in what I did. I was given some top-line jobs. And all the time, I was waiting for that moment when the hole in the center of my being would fill up. And it never did. I just wanted more and more and more. And uh, most of the people in my profession drank as heavily as I did. Fortunately for me, I didn't have a great capacity to drink. I mean, I only drank for 15 years, alcoholically, let's say, which is not a long time compared to other stories I've heard. But what alcohol did for me confirms for me that I am an alcoholic. It changed my relationship to my environment. I felt no longer shy. I felt no fear. I felt taller. I didn't feel ugly anymore. I didn't feel dirty and I didn't feel like a criminal. Because those were the feelings I grew up with as a child and into adolescence that I was somehow dirty, ugly, unattractive and somehow criminal. Which is not the bedrock for self-confidence and uh, <laughs> well-being. About the age of 22, I first, I remember my first real drunken experience. I was in Manchester working in a repertory theatre and I, I was an assistant stage manager and I was useless at that job. I couldn't cope with anything. I just had no practical gene in my body. Uh, I couldn't, and in those days you still had to put on recordings, uh, you know, for sound effects. And uh, in those days you'd play the national anthem, which is God Save the Queen or King or whatever it was. And uh, that was at the end of the show. But I used to put that on sometimes in the middle of the show. <laughs> but I had the charm and uh, good luck of a cat with nine lives because I was never fired from jobs. I always managed to walk out before they fired me. But someone did actually get the message one day and did fire me. And I went off to a, an acting school and trained for a while and uh, got my training and went back into the theatre years later. And I was very lucky, I was very fortunate. I worked in uh, the National Theatre in Britain and with some pretty illustrious people who seemed to like what I did but could never convince me that they liked me because I would always get drunk on the job and any time anyone did me a big favour and gave me a good new position or a new part in a big play, which was a big, you know, uh, which was a big deal to me, uh, I thought, what's in it for them? What do they want? And if somebody one day said to me, 
I always thought he was my enemy, but he hadn't turned out to be a friend, really. He said, they're doing it because they like you and they respect you and they value your talent. Dummy. Don't you understand? But I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the message. And what happened then, in fact, was I, I walked out of several jobs and finally I ended up in New York in 1974 in a play in New York on Broadway. And uh, the play was immensely successful. And there was a woman in that cast, her name was Mary, she died recently, and she was a member of this program, and she'd been sober a number of years, Irish-American, she had a wonderful smile. She was a real program of attraction. She smiled at me a lot, that AA smile, but she never let on that she was an alcoholic. And I was very drawn to her. Somebody told me, you know that Mary is an alcoholic. I saw oh, that's a shame. <laughs> They said she's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, oh, that's really terrible, isn't it? <laughs> they said she doesn't drink. I said, oh, yeah. That's why she smokes so much. <laughs> that's why she's so twitchy. <laughs> Sometimes they'd invite her over to the bar with me and I'd offer her a beer. I wouldn't know. I wasn't that crass. But I'd say, could you drink a beer? She said, no. She'd give me that great smile. And uh, she looked a little like Mary Tyler Moore. She had all that toothy grin. She said, no. And I said, not just one beer. She said, no. And I was fascinated by this. And at the end of 1975, I'd had a long run in this play, uh, eight months. And uh, there were days which were really terrifying for me, especially after matinees, to go on stage. I'd go over to the restaurant and have a couple of large tequilas. And uh, I remember once they brought the play down at the beginning of Act One because I couldn't go on. That was the most humiliating experience. And I go cold just thinking of it. I had to walk off stage and go home. They put somebody else on in my place. And it was all those nickel and dime things, not the big events that really got to me, but being turned out of a bar one night, which I couldn't even remember going into the night before. But going to the bar, the man said, you can't come in here. I said, why not? He said, because you came in last night and started the fight. I said, I didn't. He said, you did. <laughs> and they showed me a Polaroid of it. <laughs> It's a place called McGillicuddy's. I can't even remember where it was. But I remember that humiliation. And I lived in an apartment on East 54th Street. And I was married and I promised my wife that I wouldn't drink anymore after several scares. And I think I managed to stay sober or dry for maybe two days. And I got back one night and I tried to fit the key in the door but it wouldn't go in. And she opened the door and she said, you're drunk. And I sat on the bed and I cried. And I gave up the fight. I said, I can't cope. I don't know what's happening to me. She sat beside me and she held my hand and she said, what do you mean? I said, I'm in the grip of something terrifying. And I said, I've worked so hard and I've, I've tried to be so decent. And I feel so empty and dead. And I feel such dread in my heart. And I, she's a very calm, non-alcoholic, southern English woman. Uh, Terminally moderate in everything. She's great common sense, very even keeled. She's a lovely woman, very even keeled. And as weird to me as I must be to her. One of those people who can drink one glass of wine in the night and pour most of it down the drain afterwards. Uh, not at all like me. And I remember holding, her holding my hand. She said, I don't understand. You have so much going for you in your life. I said, I know all that. She said, but why do you do it? I said, I don't know. I'm in the grip of something terrifying. I said, I have to drink, I can't stop, and I don't know what's happened to me. She said, well, I think you need help, maybe you should go to a psycho psychoanalyst or something. And I didn't know what I did, in fact, towards the end of my run in New York. I was in a party one night, and I was so terrified of what was happening to me, and so lonely, and the worst loneliness I'd ever felt. And here I was on top of the world, in my profession, and I was stuck against the wall. I couldn't move because I thought I'd fall into this big pit which wasn't really there. And I saw Mary, the alcoholic, the covering alcoholic, and I asked her if she could help me. And uh, she said yes. And she took me out next day and we went into a rather kind of grand restaurant, I think it was Sardi's. And she said, uh, she said, I'll tell you about myself. I said, please do. She said, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, if you are an alcoholic, 
He said, if you can understand that it's the first drink that gets you drunk. If you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. And I felt so insulted. <laughs> I thought she was talking to a child. I said, well, I understand that. She said, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, no, I'll do it on my own. And I managed to put together about six weeks on my own, dry, and I felt quite comfortable. I didn't feel at all about it, with the help of a little grass, <laughs> called Acapulco Gold, which in that one night of smoking grass, I thought the, um, the CIA were after me and the FBI. <laughs> and uh, that was my only venture into non-liquid drugs. And uh, at the end of that run, it was July 1980, 1975, I, uh, the inevitable happened, I started drinking, and I came out to Los Angeles, on, I came out to Los Angeles, it was about July 4th, I remember, and started drinking severely, and it was my last six months of the worst drinking and worst nightmare I've ever experienced. When I started hallucinating, I was drinking lots of tequila, I loved tequila, I loved what it did to my brain, it unzipped my brain and made me mad and I saw visions and I had religious visions, which was very odd for an atheist. And uh, I was impossible to work with, I was making a television film up here and people would back away from me because I'd say such crazy things and this was the next day on a hangover. And um, on Christmas 75 my wife left me. Uh, she went back to England to give herself a break, to let me die, or whatever she believed I had to do. She went back to see her folks. And I remember I saw her off at the airport, and she was very cold, very unloving. I said, have a good Christmas. She said, yes, I will. She said, you have a good Christmas too. I told her that I may be an alcoholic and may get up. She said, well, good for you. She was ice cold. <laughs> she didn't want to know anymore. And I waved her goodbye, and I thought, well, that's the end of that. I was very callous, and I thought, that's the end of that, so, tough, my marriage is over. That's the way I dealt with everything. No grief, no shame, adios amigos, and that's it. I didn't care about anyone, or anything, or about myself. That's been my theme right through my life. Don't care about anyone, or about anything. And so I took off, and I went down to Arizona. I was on my way to Arizona, I was on my way to New Mexico. In fact, I wanted to get those mushrooms they talk about in Carlos Castaneda. <laughs> Well, I'd never really read Carlos Castaneda, but I'd heard about these magic mushrooms. Because booze, alcohol wasn't doing it for me anymore. And I spent one miserable Christmas Eve down in, uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas morning down in, um, Phoenix in this really bad dive hotel. And I wrote a little note to myself. I met myself in Phoenix, Arizona. And I thought I would make a good country western song. Maybe I thought I'd become a singer, you know. I eventually stumbled back, on the 27th I arrived back in Los Angeles and I sat in my apartment in Westwood, uh, feeling the loneliness that I've never, never, never felt before or since. That kind of yellow loneliness, it's that five o'clock in the evening, the evening shadows are beginning to lengthen. And I sat looking at the apartment wall across the other side of the courtyard and I knew something was over and I just wanted to die. I'd been down to Beverly Glen market and I bought a bottle of tequila, a bottle of orange juice, and I was going to try and make a tequila sunrise. And I got as far as maybe a couple of glasses and I don't remember much. The phone rang and I, went to, I was invited to a party. And what happened, the long short of it was that I went to this party, I don't remember anything about it to this day, except I remember sitting under the piano, which is not a normal way to behave, sitting under the piano, having a fight with someone and I having an argument. And uh, I'd lost my car, it was as simple as that. What I'd done, I'd left my car, I parked in the middle of the street with the engines running, the radio on, and somebody told me about this, and I stood on the doorstep of this house, from which I was being kicked out, and I said, I lost my car. They said, no, you left it in the middle of the street, don't you remember? I said, no, I don't. I, all I know is that I'm an alcoholic and I need help, desperately. And the curtain lifted a little, and I saw a little bit of light. I remember looking up at the sky, and these eucalyptus trees above me, and I said to this man, he happened to be my agent, I said, somebody up there likes me and I don't know who it is. And on the Sunday, the 27th, 20 years ago, I sat in my apartment, I had a couple of bottles of beer in the fridge, maybe, I think there were a couple of bottles of beer, I didn't want them. 
uh, but I knew it was over. And I felt the real damnation of real loneliness. And I didn't know what to do. And I thought, well, I've got to get to this Alex Anonymous outfit, wherever it is. And I phoned them, I, ph I got the number on a piece of paper, and uh, it was there on the table. I kept looking at it, and thinking about it. The next morning, I phoned up the central office in West Los Angeles, that branch on Western Boulevard, and I walked in there, and, uh, an elderly lady answered the phone, her name was Dorothy, she's dead now. Turned out she wasn't an alcoholic, she was there looking after the phones, because she honored AA so much her, they did save her husband's life. And he was in the same business I'm in. And uh, she said, would you like somebody to come around and see you? I said, no, I'll come in and see you. Because I knew that I didn't want anyone coming around with a Bible and a bottle of booze to my house, <laughs> full of charity and smiles. I hated everyone, so I didn't want any charity or help, but I knew I just really needed it. So I walked into that meeting that night, I walked into the central office and uh, I met this, this lady, this elderly, I saw, you know, lady, and we sat and talked, or she did most of the talking, she said, if you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. I said, oh my God. <laughs> but my ears were open, I was open, I was in such pain that I, I didn't care what they asked me to do, and I got up to leave and she said, Somebody will pick you up tonight and take you to a meeting. And uh, she said, I advise you to go. And I said, what do I do? She said, well, I've never been to a meeting in my life. She said, I know. She said, you're like all other alcoholics. You don't want to join anything. She said, my husband was one. I said, yeah. She said, why didn't you just come home and rest? I said, what? She said, why didn't you just come home and rest? And I got very emotional. I think of those swallows coming home to Capistrano, I guess. And something poe poetic went off inside me. And then she sprang the next one on me. She used the three-letter word. She says, why didn't you just trust in God? And suddenly the doors opened for me, sesame. And I'll never forget that experience, that minute standing there. I don't know how long it lasted, maybe a few seconds. And I grabbed hold of her because I realized that everything of my cheap little intellect hadn't worked. All my best thinking had got me into deep, big trouble. I was an outsider. I felt an outsider all my life. I was a misanthrope. I didn't like people. I tried to like people. I tried to love people. But I couldn't. I was incapable of it. And uh, I tried to love my own daughter. I tried to love my wives, but I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't. I, I played a good game at it. I could actually manufacture a feeling of it or manufacture a look of it, of caring. But I didn't really care inside. I was hard as nails, I thought. And the barriers started coming down that morning. And I got outside on the street. And a big voice in stereophonic sound surrounded me and said, it's all over. Now you can start living. It's all been for a purpose. And it was a big voice that came out of my consciousness, out of my subconscious. I call it the higher power, super consciousness, God. God, that's what it was. In me, as me. And the craving to drink was taken from me that instant and has never returned. So I take it that some powerful miracle happened that morning, about probably 11 o'clock in the morning, on the Monday morning, 29th of December, on the sidewalk of Western Los Angeles, West, Western Boulevard. And I was taken to my first meeting, and uh, I heard Chuck C. speaking that night. And I, I was in the Pacific Palisades group, a man called Don was the first speaker, he was a doctor, and then Chuck C. got up and spoke. And it was over for me, and I understood everything that happened to me. I understood why I was what I was. I understood why I drank. I could comprehend why, because I was ill inside, that I had a real personality disorder. I had something deeply wrong inside me, and I'd felt insane all my life. And I had to drink to stop myself going mad. That much I understood on that first night, within a few minutes. And I was taken over to see Chuck afterwards. He said, you just keep coming back. He said, because we get better than better. He said, we're great people. He said, you know, when we recover, we really recover. And he gave me a hug, and I'll never forget that moment. It changed my life. And so it has been, day after day. I, I, I went to many, many meetings, heard many, many speakers. I went through a roller coaster of the first year. Then I was told it would get better. And, my God, it did. In ways I couldn't even have imagined. But for 20 years now, day at a time, I have worked in this program. I've worked hard in my professional. And I've driven my body like a tank. 
and I haven't rested at all very much. And I don't regret any of it because it took me places in the world and it gave me rewards, it gave me a place in my life that I'd always wanted, but yet there was still something missing. And I can stand here and honestly say to you tonight, with every fiber of my being, that I thought I was doing okay, and I was, but it wasn't the whole truth, because something was flat and dying inside me, and I don't know what that was. I can't be specific about that. That's something I would talk to my sponsor about. It's not for me to speak publicly here about what deeply was troubling me. But there was a, a grayness and a discontent, and I just wanted more and more and more. And I thought, well, this is just alcoholic. I could not settle for placid peace of mind. I didn't want it. And I came back here to California. I'd always wanted to come back here to California. My, my wife and I moved back to England in 1984. And I felt a terrible grief in a way. I felt homesick for Los Angeles, which is very odd because it's not my birthplace. And uh, I was restless to come back here. And I felt homesick and every time I came back here, I felt alive. There's nothing wrong with my own country. That's a fine place. It's just something wrong in me, I guess. I guess one day I'll put it into perspective and see it for what it is. But it was some discontent in me, maybe some malaise, some sickness in me. But I felt that I came alive here. And maybe it was because I was to, maybe it was to do with a rebirth that happened for me here. I felt seven feet tall when I came back here. And I very quietly planned to move back. I didn't know how I was going to do that, because that's a difficult situation, especially when your partner doesn't like it here. But however, that's another area of my life which I have to work on, but I, I knew that I had to get back, and it was like it became an obsession. And I came back in uh, earlier last year, maybe the spring of next year, last year, to do some work, to do a film, and it was the hardest thing I've ever been given, the biggest challenge I've ever been given. And inside that period, I think uh, something broke in me. I'd never worked so hard in my life, and uh, 15 hours a day and things like that, working with a man who was as driven as I was, probably more driven. And I, at the end of that period, I, I, I took a few days rest, I went up to Santa Barbara, I walked on the beach a lot, and things started to pop inside me, things started to collapse inside me. Now, I don't know if any of you come as confused by this, but I, I can only describe to you what my feelings and what they were things began to collapse inside me in the most confusing way and I think there were walls and defenses and maybe I was just ready I met people up in meetings there and I met people and I first started feeling love for the first time a compassion and a companionship with the people that I'd never felt in 20 years of sobriety and I couldn't understand it people would say things to me and I'd start to cry or I'd start to fill up with tears and just having a breakfast or coffee with some guy from a meeting, I'd start to feel very vulnerable. And I wanted to touch people. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't grasp it. And I, I, I just couldn't figure it out at all. And I thought, well, maybe this is a surrender of some kind. I prayed a lot and I went to a lot of meetings. And it was quite cataclysmic, really. I got back to England and I wanted to die because I think something was dying in me and no one's fault not a place of geography not a geographical condition not a surrounding it was me which I identified it of course with my surroundings my environment it was nothing to do with the environment it was in me and I went off uh, without much rest to do some other work in France and it was I wasn't really there I pretended to be there but I wasn't really there I was here and I I just it's the most confusing time of my life. And what happened was I, I, I one day decided to come back here with one suitcase. And I sometimes look back and think maybe I was raving mad. But I, I came back here with one suitcase and left everything in England. And I bought a house here. And I'm here, and I'm living here. I don't understand it at all. <laughs> it's scary, it's frightening, and yet it's exhilarating. 
and I feel something inside me is reinventing me. It may sound a load of I don't know, but I know that something has changed drastically inside me. And I feel I've surrendered. I feel a much gentler person than I've ever been. I don't feel the hardness and the callousness that I used to feel. Uh, I feel a closeness to people and I'm much tougher. I've drawn more boundaries around my life. Um, as I said, I'm not a very good speaker. I, 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 I can only tell you what I feel like. I feel like my most vulnerable now, these last few years. But what happened when I came out here, all ready to go, all ready to live and start a whole new life? Uh, on Christmas Eve, my back suddenly went, bow! I couldn't move. I was put in the hospital Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And I got the message loud and clear that I've got to stop working, I've got to rest, and I've got to really reassess my life, a day at a time, and have a look at what I've been. None of it has been bad. It's all been an experience. It's all been some great learning experience for me, I believe. But I've got to now really pay attention. Really pay attention. Because I don't think I'll have another chance. I thought at the time when I was having the seizure in my arm, I thought it was the heart. I thought, fine, it's the big one. Fortunately, it was just a nerve in the spine. But it was a pain that dropped me to my knees. Literally. And I'm, I'm glad it happened. I wasn't glad at the time. But I'm glad now it happened because it's made me take stock of my life and look back and look forward a little. And really to pay attention to my own inner life, which I have to do. I hope I don't sound too gloomy tonight, but if that's the way I sound tough, that's the way it is. <laughs> I can promise you, it's only because I'm never speaking here, but I, I, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. This whole program. Everything, the pain, the fear, the anxiety, the excitement, the exhilaration, the confusion, the valley of death, the valley of confusion, the valley of despair, whatever it is, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I don't want to go back there. But this has enriched me. And if this is what recovery is about, we all have our various journeys to the mountaintop. If this is what recovery is about for me, then I welcome it and I'm grateful for it. And I'm immensely grateful to be here tonight and very humbled to be here tonight with such a great group. And I look around and I see we are all living miracles of this great, great program. How I can be standing here sober tonight is beyond logic is beyond rationalism because I should be dead or dying in unspeakable shame which I've felt all my life I no longer feel like a criminal I no longer feel dirty I no longer feel like an outsider though I felt like that many many times through the years of sobriety but now I don't feel like that anymore I feel I'm growing into myself I feel like I'm, I'm being absorbed by people I've never known such love and such welcome as I have known here and I probably had the same thing back in my own country. It's just that my attitudes were different. And that's how I saw the environment, through my own distorted perception. But now my perception is clearing, I think. Like the television thing, you know, when you get the picture a little clearer. I'm beginning to see the picture a little more clearly. Now, I don't know if that's a spiritual development, but I'm beginning to see the picture a little more clearly. And that is my experience. That's the way it is. And to the newcomer, to all of us, I just ask you to keep coming back. Give it the best chance of your life, because to drink is to kill the best person in the world. We destroy the very best, most beautiful part of ourselves. And I nearly missed the whole show, I nearly missed the whole party. I've had the most incredible life. It's been the most incredible journey. And I'm humbly and very, very grateful, and I thank you all very much. My name's Eric and I'm an alcoholic and uh, I don't know how to do this at all really. Plus the fact that I mean uh, I've only just started being able to speak again because about three weeks ago I had all my teeth taken out and, uh, and these implants put in and um, so it's all kind of feels funny in there and I'm, and I'm just I'm get, trying to kind of overcome this lisp and a whistle which you can hear. So, uh, and actually, uh, 
some of it is quite nice because I sound like people that I used to admire, like Otis Rush and Ray Charles, who used to sing with a little... So that's cool. But one of the great things about this was that one of the, my dreads as a, a practicing alcoholic was dentistry. Um, it was like a, a lot of other things that, that, that were really just not not available to me. I had such a, you know, the dysfunctionality in my life was so pronounced that I didn't even see a toothbrush until I was about 18. You know, it was like I, very poor stuff, all that raised with, you know, in a two up, two down, where there was an outside you know, zinc bath and no bathroom. And so, but I remember being in class at school about uh, 10 years old and the back of one of my front teeth fell off. I mean, and, and that's where a lot of my kind of disease started to kick in because I started lying. And uh, I think I'd already kind of developed you know, that hot, the thing that, you know, Lauren and other people have talked about, that thing about changing the way I felt. I started changing the way I felt right then and obviously before because uh, my teeth fell off because of sugar. Uh, and I started eating sugar. Um, I mean, it's, I can't even remember when I was probably five years old. Sugar on bread and butter. And that was like, uh, I don't know, it was like a post-war thing in England. That that's what you did, poor families did that. Um, they used to put sugar in milk too, to feed the children so that the children would, would drink the milk. And it was, it was like part of bad education, uh, all kinds of uh, just dysfunctionality. And, um, and so I was kind of set up. I was ready for this stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, there were so many other ways that it was coming into my life. I lived in a village in the country in England where we had this thing called the British Legion, which was like a veterans society, you know. And, uh, and I would see the ground. We would, as kids, would be taken and we'd be stuck outside, put outside with a packet of um, crisps or whatever you call them here, potato chips and, and a Coke or something. And they would go inside and they would change. You know, the adults would change. And they'd go in kind of quiet and reserved and miserable. And I, you'd hear them changing inside. Into, into kind of happy, uh, uninhibited, uh, you know, gregarious people, and they'd be, and they'd be having the time of their lives, and then they'd come out, and then they'd be, you know, once they were kind of out again, and they'd take us home, there would be a shift back somehow, and it would be a little bit more pronounced, it'd be a bit more kind of um, aggressive and sullen, uh, and you know, it was kind of like that was like a little microcosm of what my kind of drinking was like, that I would be. You know, just shy, withdrawn, terrified, fear-based human being who, who once I got something inside of me, became you know anybody and was up for anything. And then, as it started to wear off, I became malevolent and violent and aggressive and, and miserable, and, and in the end, suicidal. And uh, and that, that's what brought me here. And and I, you know, the one thing that you always, you know, that I go over and over in my head. And whenever I think about what I'm going to say at a meeting is that apart from um, being blessed, you know, I wonder why I was chosen for this and why we get to be chosen. I mean, I wouldn't even think about how that affects you, what you think about that. But I know for me, I don't understand why some people don't want this. I mean, I've brought, I've, I've done some 12-step work where I've brought people to the door and I've seen them turn away, walk away. And I've seen others die, you know, deliberately die when confronted with the whole notion of getting honest and, uh, and looking at their past and trying to uh, do the work that, 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 that is involved. And, um, and, I, and I don't understand why they didn't want to do it. You know, and, I, and why me, why you, why we get to be fortunate enough to... to the miracle I'm talking about is the wanting. That's the miracle in my life, is that I wanted this um, enough to do the hard work. And, I, you know, I found it pain. I'm sure we've all found it pain. I'm sure the newcomers find it very, very pain. And I can't even remember. I mean, that seems like a fog, like there's a fog between me now and where I was at then. You know, that was because I know I was just driven by fear. And, like, I remember coming to meetings trying to impress everybody with the fact that I'd been around for a while so you know uh, how do you, how does a newcomer do that you know I wanted everyone it was impossible I wanted to pretend like I'd done the steps I wanted to pretend like I was you know three or four years sober when I was only six weeks and it, and and that the pain of that 
you know, the pain of that self-consciousness, of um, the pain of asking for help. That, to me, was very, very hard work. I don't know anybody um, who seriously works on this program who finds it easy because it's not supposed to, because it requires that we that we put one foot in front of the other. And we um, and the most courageous people in the world, in my book, are recovering alcoholics. The people that walk through that door. And on a date, and that's still the same for me now. You know, driving up here tonight. I, if I was, I have to hand it over. I have. To hand it over to, to my higher power because and I, and that's easy for me now I just say you know I don't know what to do get me there I mean I pray about like each mile of the road that I'm driving get me there safe get me something to eat you know let the people be nice to me let, and, and, then, and then don't let and try to keep me from talking about what I think you know because that is a complete waste of time and it, and it uh, and they all know, you know, they, all, we are, you know, it's like we're all kind of experts on one fucking thing or another. But. <clears throat> so, and, and you know, and I just hope that he, you know, sometimes he, he, well, he answers most of my, he got me here. It's like I think it was Ted said that, you know, that whole thing about, uh, you know, I'm paying back See, because I, I prayed all through my drinking got out of every situation I was in, you know, to be relieved of this, to be got through that, and I'll never do it again, and, uh, and I'd do it again, and I'd ask, and I was always delivered. Now, and that's the other thing, is why was I, uh, and so I, I, and the thing is, you know, it really is none of my business. That's the, that's the, the kind of, the, the kernel of it all, is that I'm not supposed, to, I don't think I'm supposed to know, and whether I think I'm supposed to know or not doesn't make any difference, because I'm not going to ever find out. You know, I don't think I will. Uh, it's only when I look back on the path that I've already travelled that I see how, when I've been there meeting that person, there's been some kind of connection where they meet another person that somehow brought to uh, you know the program or something, and then I see that every girlfriend I've ever had or every you know journey I've ever taken has been in order for me to do some. It's all about service and. Um, the thing is that I can't govern that. I have no control over it. And really, all I've got to remember to do is just show up. Uh, and, the th- and, and the rest is done for me. Uh, because I don't, you know, the minute I try to figure out how this works, I don't need to come here. And that's, and that's a frightening point. Because I know people that do. And I guess, they, some, I know some that do. And it's like, well, I'm getting off on a tangent. And they turn into lecturers and they turn into experts. And I'm not, that's not what I want. I, li- I like to hear people that are, you know, around a long time, you still say, like, I don't know how to do this. You know, I don't know what, I'm frightened. Or, because then I know that they're human and I can, you know, because it's like I go back to that thing of authority. I can't be around authority. I, I need humility. I need humility as an example. I need to see that someone can stay sober a long time and not become authority, not become you know, like a governing body, not become an expert, that they can be, they can retain their innocence, that they can be childlike and still be adults, you know. And that's, that's what, I find that here. I don't find it anywhere else. And I, I know there are great people out there without programs who just seem to be on the path. And I do meet them from time to time. But if I want to be guaranteed to that kind of exposure, I come to an AA meeting and I get it here. And uh, so, I, I mean, my story is very, very simple. I just, you know, it's I'm, I'm just the same as everybody else here. It got hairy. It, uh, um, it got good. I crossed the line. It got nasty. And somewhere, you know, and I don't, you know, it was that whole thing about I knew for a very, very, very long time that I'd crossed that line. I don't remember crossing it, but I knew for at least the last 10 years of my drinking, I think, that I had to stop, and I would. Rem- I remember getting, or waking up, coming to, and and thinking, well, today is the day. I've got to stop this today, and I can't. T- I can't. I can't. I don't want to tell anybody about that because I don't want to make any promises to anyone. So this is something I want to do on my own, and then when I've done it, I can say to somebody, look, I've done. I've stopped, and th- but I'll just have a drink first to kind of like get the. <laughs> So that my mind can function, you know. 
so that I can figure out how, to, how I'm going to do it. And I, of course, the first one wouldn't even go down. It would just be reject. My body would reject it, and I'd be dry heaving, and then it would be like, and it was vodka. You know, it was all it was. Most of us know that one. And, uh, and finally, the third or fourth one would go down, and then, the sh- then I'd go, I'd be fine. And, and I'd think, right, now, so what should I, how would I go about this? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll take the bottle down to the other room and I'd move around the house, you know, um, postponing, postponing the actual whatever it was I thought I was going to do, postponing it until the bottle was empty and I was passed out again. And, uh, and, it was, and, and, you know, while I was doing that, I was thinking, well, this afternoon, this afternoon I'll stop. Of course, this afternoon was gone. You know, and, I, and I'd wake up and it would be dark and I wouldn't know whether that darkness was morning or evening. I mean, I didn't know. I'd be at home, and I didn't know where I was. You know, I was, um, and and I was married. I had a, a very successful career. And I, this has been a great thing for me in my uh, journey was being able to tell people um, that acquisition is not it. Um, because by the time I was 23, I was a millionaire with the gift that God gave me as a musician. I was making money without wanting to. I didn't. I didn't know how to stop it coming in, and I tried very hard, believe me. <clears throat> and I would leave every band. The minute they thought they wanted to be on TV, I was gone. You know? There was some, I actually, see, the, anon- the anonymous part of the program was very familiar to because somehow or another, I wanted that for me anyway. I wanted to be able to be good at something, but without anybody knowing it. But I did want them to know at the same It was like that whole paradox of, I don't want you to know, but I want the kudos. And I have it. Madness. Insanity even then. So, but um, the whole thing about that was that I didn't want to be rich. I didn't want to be successful. And, and, and as long as I had that going on, I could not stop it. And, and I'm sure it's, you know, people that want money, want success, it just doesn't happen because there's something... There's like a paradox in there. Um, But I do know that having all that stuff, having a beautiful wife, great home, and a career that just shone, no matter what I tried to do to disrupt the whole thing, it kept getting better and better. And uh, in spite of all that, at the end of each day, I was considering suicide. And uh, now, you see, how does that make sense? You know, that... And I, and I know that there are people um, who probably come into this program without very much who think that this is going to get them there. You know? and, and maybe it will. But, the, but for sure, along with it come a lot of other problems. And, and some of those things, I don't know if I'm ready for now. I mean, I'm still quite you know, self-destruct. I mean, I do like to uh, sabotage, self-sabotage a lot. And I still practice that. I still kind of set about trying to undermine it so that so that um, basically so that I can survive really, and, and retain some kind of anonymity um, so for that part of me um, there, I'm very lucky and blessed in that I did for instance have a fairly strong belief in God when I came here that was not a problem for me and I did want to be anonymous so when people uh, came up to me at, at meetings and asked for my autograph it was easy for me to say no you know, I'm, I'm Eric the alcoholic. Um, and there was a time, I think, where there was definite conflict in it for me. That when I first got sober, which is a long while ago now, it was back in 80, 1981, um, I went out on the road. You know, I went out on tour. And it sounded like shit. And I felt, and it was an awful experience. And of course, it was every, you know, I was in treatment and everyone said, counselors and fellow patients alike said, you know, don't do anything. It's like that old thing. Don't do anything. Don't get involved with anybody. Don't make any decisions. Don't do anything for a year. And within six months, I was touring America on a massive scale, hating every minute of it, and uh, and being being around um, very very dangerous situations all the time, and not and really kind of feeling miserable. And I suppose you know I was you know I was on the way back, and I and I relapsed as a result of that. And and in my, I went back into treatment, and in that period of time, um, being back in treatment, I had to confront the idea that, you know, that it was, um, 
I was either going to come back here as an alcoholic above all, uh, or uh, I was probably going to die. You know, and this was, I mean, I had it. I have it in spades, this disease. I really do. I have it on every level. I mean, I, I'm, I, I project all the time. I'm a fear-based guy. Um, that, you know, shame, I go into shame spirals at the drop of that. I'm getting better. Like, like Lauren said, I'm improving. But I don't do anything. I mean, all I do is I, I come to meetings and I, and, I, and I pray that God will do most of the rest. I, will try, I work the steps, but I'm very conscious of the fact that my, my defects are not really mine to control. I mean, I can't, I've never been able to, like someone else said, I don't know how to hand it over. I still don't know quite how to hand it over other than to try and help somebody else. You know, when, when I get into that predicament about self-obsession, I kind of got a, a, a switch where I think, well, think, think about somebody else. Go and do something for somebody else. That's my way of handing over. But I don't know if that's the right. I mean, it's the way I do it. But for me, it's still, it's tough, you know. And uh, the thing about where I've had to work very hard is being, you know, having this kind of celebrity as a musician and being, like, on the media. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and there's recently been a thing where I tried to, I've, I've put together a, a center in the Caribbean to to help people, and I and I realise that that's not an AA project. You know, I've had to kind of really work hard on my boundaries around this stuff. It's, that's you know, treatment centres are not AA. You know, that's like they they they, they work with the twelve step program and they advise, but nevertheless, you know, I've, and, and it's still a separate issue. And when I was Confronted with these people that you know that I put together to make this thing work, they said, "Well, you're going to go out there and have to go out there. You're our only asset. Nobody knows this fucking thing is here. You got to go and tell them that it's here. You got to, and in order, you know, in order to do that, what I said, well, what am I going to do? I go on 60 minutes, do the, the Today Show, I do like all kinds of fucking magazine and newspaper articles, and in the course of that, I'm on the edge the whole time of breaking my anonymity." And that's been a real tough thing. And, you know, that's given me, that whole exercise gave me a great a learning curve about what, my, how important my anonymity is to me. And it is really about my boundary, about, you know, how much, I, because now I've got to the point where I love this thing. I love it above all. And even when I say that, I can feel a tingle coming through me because it's a spiritual thing for me that, that, that what we do and the way we help other people and ourselves in the process is not to be fucked with. It is not to be compromised. Yeah. And I've been, you know, and, and it's like, it's amazing how, how when, when people are faced with that, how it tantalizes people. You know, like, uh, I remember my sponsor being involved in the kind of sort of business project where, you know, they had a long conference with these other people that he was involved with on some business thing. And it was all folding. It was getting crazy. And somehow or another, he sorted it all out. And after the meeting, one of these guys came up to him and said, you know, I don't know, what, I don't know how you did that. And it was brilliant. But what's your secret? What, what's, what have you got in, going on? And he said, well, um, it's nothing to do with me. And it is a secret. <laughs> you know, that was like, that's what it... And, and I love that, you know, that, that and, and that guy, you know, he's, he's got 20 years and he is like a, a saint to me, but he's one of those guys that says, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, I just go to meet him, you know, and I love that, but, but it is very difficult. I've had to do a lot of work going up, going to, to talk to people in treatment centers, saying like, you know, the, that primary purpose, you know, where they, when we read the preamble, our primary purpose stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. That is my primary purpose. And I've had to be, you know, listen, my primary purpose is not making sure this fucking treatment center works. My primary purpose is if I get the opportunity going in there and telling the alcoholics in there, the recovering people that want to stay sober, my story, not what I think, or not, you know, please get your other pals to come in because we need the money, you know. But seriously, just to be there so that they can see that I'm a guy with a load of money who's had a great career but who still occasionally thinks about suicide and, you know, although that's 
got a lot better, I can assure you. But but that that is not it. That it is about peace of mind, which comes from other other people, comes from our common welfare, um, and that's what I always rely on. You know that um, in any given difficult situation, there's two options for me. One is to isolate and try and figure it out, and eventually I can self-destruct and go down the road that I've already travelled. The other one is to come here and ask you for what you did when you had the similar experience. And that's the one I've chosen most. And it works. And it, and it is usually... I mean, I'll avoid people that try and, you know, proselytize or, or, or lecture or tell me what they think. I will say, well, tell me what you did when this happened to you so that I get the experience. And just and usually it is the simplest thing imaginable. And that's what works. And, uh, so that's it for me. I mean, I flew all this way to come to this meeting, and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I'm really, really, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I, I had no idea. I, I remember actually driving up the coast, thinking that about 20 years ago, I came up here to make a record at a place called Shangri-La. And man, is it, is it different now? I mean, am I, I don't know if it's still there, the place. But some of those guys are dead, you know. Um, one of them's in, and this was a group called The Band, you know, that was a great band. And one of them hung himself, and he was like, we, we drank together. I mean, he was like a Grand Mania freak. He drank Grand Mania at the bottom, and I love man, that. That's a man's way of drinking, you know. Um, and he hung himself. And I'd so, and I've seen so many people, lost so many friends who, didn't get this light shone in my eyes. And which brings me back to that thing is like God God somehow or another chose us and now we get to choose. And, and that's the other thing about this program that I love the most is that I had a choice today. And like Lauren also said, I can look back and see that it's all been choice and it still is. You know. I can choose and, and I am responsible for my own happiness and, and for my my own life. I'm totally responsible today. I don't blame. I try to still, because I am an alcoholic, and, and I will always, I will always, always act in that typical way. My first response is usually to you know, fuck it. It's his fault or her fault, and then I modify, and, and that's, and then I act. I act usually on the modification. For that, I'm really grateful. Um, it's been almost 12 years for me, uh, and, and I guess I've got another 12 to go before I'll have paid back my debt. And, uh, uh, and I hope a bit more, you know. Um, I don't ever really think about this as being a long, long road. It's still one day at a time for me. I really don't make too many plans. I, I try to take the program to everything I do, the way I, the way I love, live, work. It's about spontaneity and being in the moment. And we're very, very lucky to be given this gift. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for you listening to me tonight. Thanks. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.